he's saying, all can come, all can hang out with me. Jesus is shaking up the status quo. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He saw your first breath before it happened, and he knows your last breath before it ever ends. God delivers, God saves, God rescues. I mean, that's cool. I got chills. There is no disease, there is no disposition or depravity that can separate you from the love of God, which is yours through Christ Jesus. Let's give it up for our worship team this morning. Um, God is good, amen? Man, I love singing those creedal kind of songs like that. They get me pumped, um, being the theology nerd that I am. It's like, um, it's like we, uh, we found some Lutheran music and we put some life in it. So uh, if you're Lutheran, I'm sorry. Um, welcome to week two of the Apostles' Creed, and um, if I say that I'm excited once, I'll probably say it like 25 times as we step through this sermon series. And kind of as we as a pastor team, we sat down and we really started trying to brainstorm around this. We had, we had said a year ago during this time period, we would do a sermon series on doctrine. And as, as, as we started kind of having discussions about what that looked like, um, given the fact that we were coming out of the ghost sermon series and knowing kind of the depths that we would be covering coming out of the ghost, um, we were like, man, we, we really need something to kind of frame some really good context of doctrine around. And so uh, as, as we started praying, God kind of opened um, some doors and um, just so happened that in our reading, kind of in our personal study, and we kind of landed in this, this place of the Apostles' Creed. And maybe, maybe you're new to the church and you're like, I have, I have no idea what you're talking about when you say Apostles' Creed. Uh, first thing I want to say is it is not the Apostles' Creed as in um, apostrophe S. It is not written by the Apostles, okay? So when we say Apostles' Creed, we're not suggesting that this creed was written by the Apostle Peter, by the Apostle Paul, by the Apostle James. No, we're not saying that at all. In fact, what this is is the early church. Um, this, this creed is nearing 2,000 years old, so you can imagine this is very soon after Jesus' death, very soon soon at the end of the life of the apostles this creed's kind of beginning to be developed by the early church fathers the the patristics is what you would call them not the apostles but the guys who immediately followed them the guys who were discipled by the apostles the patristics is what they're called and and this this particular creedal statement was developed one uh, for a couple different reasons. One, it is the um, kind of culmination or the culmination of all of the apostles' teachings, okay? So what they're trying to do here is we're trying to distill down 66 books worth of literature into a creedal statement, something that we can confess as a body, as the ecclesiastical community together in church. And then secondly, they're trying to teach Scripture to folks who are illiterate. Now remember, um, during the early church, and especially for much of medieval history, folks did not know how to read. And so it was critical and paramount that the music, as well as the creedal statements that were confessed in the church, taught the people scriptures in such a way that they could confess it or recite it to where they could remember it. And so... The church has kind of served as one of the oldest teachings at almost 2,000 years old and, and has stood to encourage, correct, and teach the church the truths of Scripture. Um, Dr. Al Muller, who is the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, he says this, he says, The creed is a summary of what the Bible teaches. A narrative of God's redemptive love. A concise statement of basic Christianity. All Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, but none can believe less. The early church believed so critically in the Apostles' Creed that they often referred to the Apostles' Creed as the rule of faith. In fact, they would come together in every service and they would confess all together as a body in unison the Apostles' Creed because it helped them remember the truths of Scripture. It taught the theological um, foundations through which our faith is built upon. They called it the rule of faith because it breaks down the major teachings of 
the Bible. And so, you know, kind of before I press on, I want to stress a couple things. We said it last week and we will say it probably every single week, every subsequent week from this point forward for the next six weeks following this message. We are not preaching the creed. We are not preaching the creed, but we are using the creed to preach the Bible. Okay, so we're not up here preaching it as if um, as if it is as, as authoritative as the scriptures. No, it is a document that has been gleaned from the scriptures collectively to bring together to frame us together. And and another thing I want to say is every line of the Apostles Creed is a primary theological pillar for us. Every single line of the Apostles' Creed is a primary theological pillar for us. So what does that mean for us as Rest Church? And Rest Church, speak. If you've been to a family partner class with us, if you sat with us to understand what we believe, we would say that everything that is contained within the Apostles' Creed is a primary issue for us as a church, which means we believe as our family partners, you should 100% affirm the teachings of the Apostles' Creed. And as we step through it, you will see there's nothing out in left field this is kind of the culmination of our faith. This morning, um, as we're going to do every week, we're going to ask someone within our body to uh, lead our entire church family as we say the Apostles' Creed together. And this morning, one of our deacons, Carl, is going to lead us. And um, we ask that we would all stand together and that you would say it loud with him. I believe in God the Father, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can grab a seat. I can pray while you're sitting, I promise. Father, Lord, we, we come to you this morning as a church body. Lord, to, to understand the doctrinal statements of our faith because it brings depths to our faith. It serves as an anchor in the storm. It serves as a pylon hiding or holding a, a mighty tower to the ground. Lord, I pray that as we open up your scriptures, that you would reveal yourself to us. That God, that you would invade this space, that you would invade this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, church family, we're going to focus in on Jesus in the Apostles' Creed. And the place that we're going to spend most of our time, or well, literally all of our time today, is I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. Our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. If you attended a function that Queen Elizabeth was present at, she wouldn't be introduced to us as Liz Windsor. No, she would be presented to us as this. Her Majesty Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and her other realms and territories queen, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith. Each part of the queen's title explains her true identity. It explains kind of who she is. And the same can be said about this week's portion of the Apostles' Creed. It presents God the Son to us in terms that communicates to us his authority and what he commands. And so what do we see kind of like right off the top? Right off the top, when we look in at this creed, we see it referred to Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So we 
We need to unpack that to understand what is being said about Jesus. In fact, as, as we look at the Apostles' Creed, one thing that we're going to find is not just today, but this creed, more than anything, is a story about Jesus. More than any other person in the Godhead, this creed was written to bring authoritative power, to bring authoritative teaching around the person of Jesus. And so as we open up, we look at I believe. And Pastor A.B. talked a little bit about I believe last week and kind of what this means. And what we see is every single line in the Apostles' Creed starts in this same fashion. I believe. And, and what we looked at last week is this, this word of I believe or in the Latin credo, what it actually means is I give my heart to. I give my heart to. The, the language here is to basically say that I am expressing with my deepest possible conviction that I hold this to be true. It is not just a mouth confession, but it is a heart confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If we were to study much about history... We would see about this man, Jesus. Jesus was a really, really common name during first century Judaism. If we were to find ourselves back in Galilee at the dawn of the first century, we would find many, many, many Jewish men named Jesus. And in fact, some scholars have tried to use this particular um, thing to say that Jesus was and this Un, I mean, he was a completely ordinary and nothing special about him kind of person. However, what they miss is the significance to the link of Jesus' name and what it really means. If we were to kind of understand the backdrop of the context of the gospel story in relation to the Old Testament, we're going to pick up a few very key things. Despite Jesus having a common name, Jesus, it carries this significance. Why? Because the garden. So as we come back to Genesis chapter 3, what we find is that God has made the world. He's placed Adam and Eve in the garden and all is perfect. He gives them one rule. Don't eat from the tree that has a long name. That's really the only rule he gives them. And they defy this rule, and when they do, they sin. And that sin causes all, say all, all. say all. all, all of creation to begin to die. See, it wasn't just humanity that was affected, but all of creation began to die. Adam sinned, and when Adam sinned, as Paul teaches us, when he sinned, all of us, every single one of us, Adam acted as our federal head. Adam acted as if we were acting. And by his sin, every single subsequent man from that time on has sinned. Enmity was created between God and man in the garden. So what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, let's dig into the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to pause here because I want to tell you a funny story from my life. Every single night, I get down um, on my knees and I pray with my two boys. And every night, just like most of you, when I get done praying, I say, in Jesus' name, okay. And it's actually amen, just in case we're all on the same page. We're a bunch of hicks. I say amen too, but you know, if we're, if we're doing some linguistic study, it's actually amen, but... Anyways, I say in Jesus' name, amen. And one night, Ezekiel, I swear, looks at me and goes, is that his last name? <laughs> and, and, you know, like, you, as you sit there, you have to unpack that, right? You're like, the, the, the hundreds of times that I have prayed over you and you've heard me say, in Jesus' name, amen. And my kid now goes, I guess that's Jesus' last name. Amen. That's a weird last name. 
But the reality is, is if we look at this Jesus Christ, the chances are that many of you don't necessarily understand what's going on when you say Jesus Christ. In fact, every time you say Jesus Christ, you are making a doctrinal statement. Say, I'm a theologian. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Every time you say Jesus Christ, you're making a theological statement. Because what tends to happen is we want to treat Christ as if it is Jesus' surname. It's so much greater than his surname. Jesus, in the literal sense, means the Lord saves. The Lord saves. And Christ means the anointed one of God, the Messiah. The anointed one of God, the Messiah. And so what are we saying? When we say Jesus Christ, you're declaring the Lord, Elohim, saves through the anointed one, the Messiah. So you're making a doctrinal statement every time you say that. And so, so when we look at this common name, Jesus, in the context of first century, but then we look at, the, at, at that against the backdrop of Genesis, what we see is we see a holy and righteous God who is invaded, who has stepped down into human history in order that he might save us. See, we, we had enmity between us and the Father. We were separated, separated so much so that if we looked upon God the Father with our human eyes, we would die. In fact, we see examples of this in the Old Testament as God shields Moses and says, you can't look at me. You can look at the glory, the remnant of my glory as I pass by. And as he comes down from the mountain of looking upon the remnant of God's glory, the people of Israel cannot look upon him because he is shining his face is like the sun. It is shining so bright. And so as we see here, Jesus Christ, the anointed Messiah, he invades, he initiates with us mere humans. Our God is an initiating God. Amen. Our God did not leave us broken and destitute. Our God didn't say the heck with them. They didn't follow my rules. I'm done with them. No, no, no. In fact, if you read the scriptures, like, I mean, if you truly read the scriptures, what you'll find is a lot of what's said in children's church and Sunday school wasn't the whole picture, right? Right? I mean, because sometimes, uh, you know, Molly edits the lessons that are are taught in, in um, in the our kids. And sometimes, man... It like kind of waters it down so much that it misses some of the big things. And Molly adds those things back in. And we, we have discussions about it. But the truth is, is if you look at the Old Testament and you look at the men of the New Testament, you find out, man, it's, it's kind of like some Jerry Springer stuff. I mean, like, I know some of you right now, you're like, did, did our pastor just say? Yes, I did. Like, if, if you actually read the scriptures, you find, like, dudes sleeping with, like, their children kind of stuff. You find, like, um, um, like daughter-in-laws getting knocked up by their father-in-law kind of stuff. You find the guy who is referred to as the man after God's own heart um, um, having an affair with one of his friends um, a wife and then um, killing his, his friend over having an affair to hide his affair. What you find is, is that God never abandons us sticky, icky kind of people. No, in fact, he, he intervenes. He invades. And that's what we see here when we look at Jesus Christ's name. He is saying, I'm coming. I'm intervening. I am initiating. Our God is the initiator. So, man, I look at that and I go, amen. Because I don't know about you, man. Don't be under any false pretenses. I'm a broken man. I'm a man who fights and battles sin just like you. The only difference between me and you is God put a calling for me to preach the gospel from a stage. I am no better than you. In fact, I would suggest there are many of you better than me. And so when I look at that, I go, praise the Lord. He didn't leave me abandoned. So, As we look at this against that backdrop, 
what we see is that the gospel writers wanted us to weigh the significance of these titles, Jesus Christ, as they appear very early on in the gospel story. So first, first kind of appearance that we see, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Um, this, is, this is the angel, Gabriel, speaking to Joseph, um, Jesus' earthly stepfather. And this is what he says. She will bear a son, speaking of Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But follow with me. Go to Luke. Luke chapter 2, 10 and 11. This is the angels appearing to the shepherds out in the field following Jesus' birth. This is their declaration. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born in this day the city of David, a Savior who is what church? Christ the Lord. So the New Testament writers wanted us to wrestle with and weigh the significance of these titles. They want us to know right from the beat, right from the beginning, that Jesus was the Lord God. Notice the last thing ascribed to Jesus there by the angels. He is Christ the Lord, Dr. Al Mohler, speaking of this, he says, when we believe in Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who was promised to Israel, the one who fulfills all the promises and so much more, calling him Jesus Christ unmistakably emphasizes that he was and is our Savior. At the mention of his name, if we understand its meaning, we confess that we are a people who are pitiable and weak, defenseless and helpless. We need a Savior. We need Christ the Lord. Press on. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. Chances are this next scripture that we're going to flip up here, you can quote it by memory. In fact, it's the most sought after, most quoted verse in all of scripture. And what tends to happen is, is we only read verse 16. And verse 17, I would suggest to you, man, is really the beauty of the gospel. Let's read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through through him. What we see here is once again a holy and righteous God sending forth his son in human flesh, not to condemn us because he had every right to condemn us, right? He had every right to put himself on a pedestal and to judge us and, and to say, you, you have fallen gravely, get away from me. He had every right to smite us. He had every right to grab this rock that we call home and throw it against the cosmos where we would all die. But he didn't. No. He intervened and he saved us. But most of us, when we learned this Scripture, maybe you're like me, you learned it in the KJV. How many of you say amen to that? Yeah, you learned this. And so if you learned it in the KJV, this is what you would say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, what church? Begotten, begotten son. And so, and so that's a peculiar word. How many of you work begotten into your, you know, everyday conversations? I mean, we, we don't do that, right? We, we, don't, we don't say, hey, man, um, I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was begotten or anything like that. No, no. Since the beginning of time, God looked and foresaw the fall in the garden and the subsequent effects that it would have on humanity, that it would have on creation. And God chose, even before it happened, even before Adam and Eve were in the garden, even before that's ever happened, God chose to send Jesus the Son. God was not surprised in the garden. God is never surprised. He wasn't running around in heaven when he, when he saw Adam and Eve take of the garden. He wasn't going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They didn't, have, they didn't have a board meeting between the Trinity in heaven. No, the plan from the beginning was to send Jesus the Son. 
And the Jesus that was sent from the throne room of heaven, he's not just another human being whom was named Jesus. He was the preeminent God, co-creator of the world, Jesus Christ. In fact, when we quote that only begotten son portion, our modern ears don't understand what it means. We, we want to believe that it's a synonym, a synonym for being created. That, that God created. He, he begot God and sent Him first. However, the Greek word here for, for, for what's seen here in, in, in um, uh, begotten, it's monogenesis. Expressing not that Jesus was created, but that He is uniquely God the Son. Not that He was created, but that He was uniquely God the Son. Jesus is of equal substance and co-eternal with the Father. Jesus has always been God, but there was a moment in time when God begot Him into the flesh. And that's what it means. Not that, not that He wasn't preeminent. Not that He has not been eternal since the foundations of the world. No, He has always existed. Even before the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, has always been. He is eternally the Son of the Father. Listen to what Paul says, speaking about Jesus' preeminence in, first, I mean in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Maybe you're going. All right. I heard you, you're yelling at me, you're clearly excited about this. But what are you driving home? Like, wait, wait, maybe you're asking, what is it you want me to, to know or to understand about what you're saying here? To put it simply, it's this. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is not a created being that was simply anointed. Jesus is not Lord because God chose to call him Lord after he created him. Jesus is God. And before the creation, the Son was already begotten by the Father. Jesus is not the Father or God manifesting himself in different ways throughout Scripture as the oneness Pentecostals like to teach. As the Scriptures clearly point, uh, paint for us, Jesus is distinctly different from both God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. To suggest that Jesus is not fully God or to not affirm the Trinity is heresy. Point blank. It's heresy. Jesus is the co-creator alongside of God the Father. And together, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit reign over all of creation. To suggest anything else, would, for me, it would be asking you to do mental cartwheels around what the scriptures reveal to us. We see the Trinity from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit hovered over the waters. At one point, God, Elohim, speaking, Moses writing, speaking on behalf of Elohim, says, let us create man in our own image. One or two things, either there's a trinity or we serve a paranoid, schizophrenic God. So I don't need to do mental cartwheels because God has always existed as three persons made of one. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Jesus' willingness to have Himself subjected to the weight and the penalty of our sin and to pay our ransom was a love not of this world. 
As a result, Jesus became a Lord, the eternal divinic king. Admonishing the church in Philippi, Paul writes these words to the church in Philippi in order for them to humble themselves. And he uses Jesus as an example of how we as Christ followers are to humble ourselves. Listen to what he says, um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but in the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, meaning that he empties himself of his divinity and stepping into human flesh. He emptied himself by taking the form of of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The early church used to quote this text along with the Apostles' Creed every single week in their gatherings. This verse is the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 40, verse 5, that Christ would reveal His glory to all the peoples. This doctrine is also the substance of all the Apostles' teachings found in Acts 2, 36, where it says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and And Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is Peter speaking before the Sanhedrin. This is bold speech that Peter is giving to the Sanhedrin. In fact, this is punishable by death under Judaism, what he's saying to the Sanhedrin. He's saying, let me tell you what, the guy you just put to death, he is God himself. He is the Lord. And Christ, no matter our political affiliation, worldview about creation, the scriptures paint a clear picture here for us. One day, every tongue, whether willingly or forcibly, will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. There's no way around it. When we confess Jesus is Lord, we are simply stating He is before all, above all, and the creator of all. We are confessing our dependence on Him for our very next breath. We are confessing our desire for relationship with Him. So I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Up until the past few centuries, the Immaculate conception was not really questioned within the church. But as secularism has kind of um, pervaded or invaded every other aspect of life, this notion of, of the um, virgin birth has been, it's been questioned. It's been under attack. And, and even some pastors have suggested that, man, we need to do away with this antiquated, archaic thinking that, you know, hey, um, um, that there was a virgin birth. Because let's be honest, that's not physically impossible. There's no way that a virgin birth could actually happen you don't think it's a miracle that's why they call it a miracle I mean you know dead people don't just walk around do they it's, it's, it's a miracle to suggest anything other than full 100% conviction in the virgin birth turns our entire faith into a house of cards easily blown over by a toddler. I'm going to stress this to you guys very, very keenly. To suggest that the virgin birth didn't happen makes our faith null and void. Null and void. Maybe maybe you're like, "I, I, I don't understand. First, I want to point out the scriptures teach us nothing less than the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. 
They teach nothing less. So for us to suggest that it was made up, it's archaic, it's antiquated, we're essentially now beginning to pick apart the scriptures and say what is or is not orthodox. And the moment that we open up the canon of scriptures and we begin to say what is or is not orthodox, we might as well shut it and throw it in the trash. Without the virgin birth, church, there is no gospel. Without the virgin birth, there is no gospel. A Christian who doesn't believe in the virgin birth is in eternal peril. For, one, for the one whom he believes is not the one whom the scriptures testify about. The Apostles' Creed, therefore, has included the virgin birth for good reason. It is true. It is essential. It is glorious. As the Creed suggests, Jesus Christ is the seed of a woman. Church, I need you to hear this. Jesus Christ is the seed of a woman. He is not the seed of a man. Which is humongous when you start to understand substitutionary atonement. Because if he wasn't conceived of the Holy Spirit, and I could have went for 25 minutes on the Shekinah glory of God and how that, Eve, uh, how that Mary became pregnant, and I'm not going to do that, but it's really cool. I wanted to tell you about it, that I at least know about it. But if that had not have happened, if the Holy Spirit, the glory of God had not came upon her in order to immaculate conceive, we would all be stuck in our sin. We would all be stuck in our sin. Because as the scriptures reveal to us, Jesus Christ, the seed of a woman whose heel would strike the serpent and would reverse the curse by a sovereign act of God. The seed of a woman would do that. Dr. Muller says this. He says, without the virgin birth, Christ is not God. If Christ was not conceived by the Holy Spirit, then he must have a human father. And thus he is not divine. And also, without the virgin birth, the gospel does not provide salvation. If the virgin birth is a lie, then Jesus could have never reversed the curse and saved sinners. Moreover, if Christians deny the virgin birth and treat the conception of the Holy Spirit as a myth, then they threaten the whole range of other Christian doctrines, such as the truthfulness of Scripture, the humanity of Christ, the sinfulness of Christ, and the nature of grace. The early church fathers thought it was of the utmost importance for the church to understand the hypostatic union that we see here in the creed. And you may be going, hypostatic, what, what, is, what is that? Is that like a calisthenic? Hypostatic union is the meaning of In Jesus, God and man became one person. A person unlike any other the world had ever seen. A person unlike anyone that will ever come again. He became God and man all in one vessel. They understood in order for Jesus to save the world of its sin, Jesus must be both God and man. And in order to achieve this union between God and humanity, Jesus must be conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. Only Jesus, only a, a divine person serves as the perfect substitute and offering to God the Father. Christianity becomes a house of cards when we remove the virgin birth. Because the scriptures teach us that every one of us, the seed of men, every one of us are the seed of men. And as Paul lays out so eloquently and so perfectly in Romans, every one of us are born sinners by nature. We are totally depraved coming out of our mother's womb. And I have sweet ladies come up to me every time I say that and go, I don't believe that's true. You can't make me believe my little baby is, is bad. And I want to go, take your little baby to that nursery and just hang out behind a you know, glass wall and we'll see how perfect and beautiful it is when it throat punches another kid over some Cheerios. You didn't have to teach that baby how to throat punch. It came out knowing. Right? Right? I mean, if you ever had kids, man, you know, man. It's like the first time your kid lies to you, you're like, who even taught you how to do that? 
Like, like you're, you're, you're baffled. You don't know what to do. You're, you're kind of reacting. You're like, you're like Ricky Bobby. You don't know what to do with your hands in that moment. Right? So it's like, we don't have to be taught how to be bad. We, we, we don't have to be taught. And so to suggest that Jesus was not born of the seed of the Holy Spirit through the woman would suggest that, man, Jesus was just another dude walking around first century Judea. It would, it would suggest that Jesus is nothing greater than Confucius. Jesus is nothing greater than Muhammad. Jesus is nothing greater than Buddha. He is just a regular old dude. And therefore, if that guy did die on a cross, his death means nothing. Because he was a sinner just like you and I. And the bad thing is, is when we say when we say or we suggest that the virgin birth is not 100% true, you're essentially nullifying your faith in that moment. You know what Paul says about us when we do that? He says we are a people to be most pitied. We're a people to be most pitied because we're still stuck in our sins. God the Father is still angry at us and one day we will be punished apart from that blood. And so there is no gospel. There is no gospel apart from the virgin birth. It is paramount. It is orthodox. It is primary in our faith. So as a church, if we are truly Christians, we have no choice but to affirm the virgin birth as true and orthodox. So when we evaluate these statements such as the Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. When we evaluate these things, when we evaluate this creed and we, we look in at Jesus, we are being asked a question. We are being asked a question, church. Whether you know it or not, you're being asked the same question that Jesus asked His disciples in Matthew chapter 16 as they came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. What is that question? Who is Jesus? Saying this, verse 13 of chapter 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. I want to pause there. These are all great compliments. Every one of them are a great compliment. If any one of us were attributed to any of the men mentioned here, you would be like, yes, every man mentioned here is a, 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 the creme de la creme of our faith. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, they are some of the most sought after men in Scripture. They are beautiful men of God. But that's not what Jesus was after. He wasn't saying, am I a good teacher? You know, when, when, he's not asking you, do you affirm that Jesus is a good teacher? Do you hold his teachings and think, oh, they're good. They're a good pattern to live your life after. No, that's not what he's asking. That's not what he's asking. And we see that here in verse 15. He says to them, but who do you say I am? He wants to know from his disciples. And the same question is to you today. You can, you can confess the, the Apostles' Creed. You can confess these things. And you can say them out loud, but that doesn't matter. That's lip service. And we can all agree the world is full of enough lip service. Amen? He's asking you, who do you say I am? Who am I to you? Because at the end of the day, it's a personal, individual faith. You're not getting to heaven because of mama. You're not getting to heaven because of data. You're not getting to heaven because your grandma prayed over you every night. Those are well and good, but they won't get you to heaven. All it comes down to is this question that Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter looks face to face at the eternal God, the creator, the co-creator of all of creation. And he says this, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one from God. 
the Son of the living God. The question is the same for you as you confess these, these, these creedal statements, as you look at the Apostles' Creed, as you look maybe back at some of the old confessions, such as the Nicene Creed or the, the Book of Common Prayer, which are great things to pray, great things to study, but at the end of the day, we can know systematic theology inside and out, and we can still split hell wide open. You can know the scriptures. You can quote John 3.16. You can quote the entire book of Proverbs. You can know it front and back. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, you aren't saved. So as we come to this moment, it's a watershed moment for every single one of us. It's a question that we must ask ourselves, who is Jesus to me? And the reality is we can't just confess Jesus as Savior. That's not good enough. We must confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. Jesus is not interested in our ability to confess the facts found in these creedal statements. He's, he's interested in our ability to believe wholeheartedly. Remember, what, is, what, is this, what does this believe mean? It means that we give our whole heart to we give our whole heart to. Jesus is not interested in a piece or a portion of our heart. He wants it all. Jesus is not interested in a piece and a portion of your life. He wants it all. He says, I'm not, I'm not settling for half. I don't want a little bit. I want it all. And so there's, there's two groups of folks here as, as we come to Matthew 16. I feel like every time I preach this text, there's, there's two different groups of Folks, the, the first one is, is those who have not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. And, and, and you might not say today, I'm willing to answer that question with you, preacher. I'm willing to have that conversation with myself. I might not be there today. I want to tell you, you might not be there today. But one day, whether you like it or not, you will have that conversation. I just hope and pray that you have that conversation on this side of heaven. And you might say, oh, are you trying to scare me, Pastor? If that's what it takes for you to meet Jesus, absolutely. Because the reality is that there is a real, just as hell as the seat you're setting in, that one day if you don't know Jesus, you will spend eternity there. And the full wrath of God's glory will be poured out on you for all time Worse than what was experienced to Jesus on the cross. So, I can't implore you enough to ask yourself that question. Who is Jesus? Is He the Lord of your life? Is He the King of kings? Do you affirm that He is the co-creator of all creation? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. And then the second group, there's the second group. There's the group who, who says, yes, I, I would affirm Jesus is Lord. I'm, Pastor, I confess, I'm a Christian. I believe in that. Why are you so animated with me? Because the reality is, is, is that from the outside looking in, sometimes it's hard to see that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Sometimes looking at my life, it's hard to see some of the conversations that I have. Is Jesus the Lord of my life? Do I need to give him more space? Do I need to say, God, let take over, take your Calvary and charge into my heart and, and man, just eradicate the sin that is in my life? I have to have those conversations too. But the reality is, is Jesus is asking not to be the Lord of here and there. He wants to be the Lord of everything that you have. Your job, your family, how you, how you discipline your children, how you love your wife. He says, I want it all. And the reality is, is He can do it so much better than we can. If we would just let go. If we would just let go. So I'm going to ask you right now. Right now. 